Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd reporting from Washington. We have a bunch of new developments today on the Biden administration's difficulty in dealing with the border and, of course, the political quagmire that involves anything having to do with immigration. We've got a highly uh, suspect claim from Russia uh, that charges Ukraine, uh, attempted to somehow assassinate President Putin, and the Fed just raised interest rates to a 16-year high as it continues to try to fight rising inflation, but their rate hike came with a caveat. But we're going to begin today, where we've had to begin so many shows in recent months, breaking news of death and injuries from an active shooter situation. This time, the location is Midtown Atlanta, a medical center. Authorities say at least one person has been killed, four others injured. The gunman apparently is still on the loose and is considered armed and dangerous. The Atlanta PD released these images of the suspected gunman, 24-year-old Dion Patterson. Moments ago, police told reporters that Patterson opened fire while he was in the waiting room of the medical facility. He then carjacked a vehicle and fled the scene. These images appear to show the suspect inside the medical center with a gun. Police tell NBC News that they believe he was there with his mother for an appointment. The shooting in Atlanta comes as the U.S. has now seen at least 190 shootings this year that meet the gun violence archives definition of a mass shooting. So to put that in perspective, Meet the Press Now has been continually updating this map of mass shootings this year. Again, the definition being four or more injured, not necessarily killed, but injured uh, in one, um, by one gunman. We didn't have to update it today. Why? Because this is not the first mass shooting in Atlanta in 2023. Speaking this afternoon from the White House podium, Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre told reporters that President Biden has been made aware of the situation. Is the president frustrated about what we're seeing in our communities, in our schools, in our churches, in this epidemic that we've seen, this gun violence epidemic? Uh, and this is a, yes, of course he's frustrated. We know that Congress needs to take more steps uh, to deal with the violence that we're seeing, uh, again, in our communities, our schools, our churches, which just should not be. We should not be. American people should be able to feel free uh, to go to to uh, to go to into a grocery store, to go to church. Our kids should feel free and feel safe, and our teachers, administrators should feel safe to go into a school. And right now, we're seeing weapons of war on our streets. Minutes ago, Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock spoke about the shooting from the Senate floor and said that his own children were were at the time on lockdown in their school in Atlanta. I think that the unspoken assumption is that this can't happen to me. But with a mass shooting every day, the truth is the chances are great. I shudder to say it, but, but the, the truth is, in a real sense, is only a matter of time. that this kind of tragedy comes knocking on your door. Joining me now from the scene in Atlanta is my colleague, NBC News correspondent Katie Beck. Jim Cavanaugh is a retired ATF special agent in charge and NBC News law enforcement analyst, uh, and he'll be able to help us out here. But Katie, I know we just got an update from Atlanta authorities. What can you tell us, and do they at least have a general idea where the suspect is? Well, at this point, Chuck, the answer to that is no. Uh, what they are tracking is a lot of information that came, what they say, from surveillance footage from cameras that were probably inside the hospital and outside on the street. They said that they believe uh, that the suspect exited the building and carjacked a vehicle and that he is no longer in this area. Uh, what they are asking for is the public's help. They are offering $10,000 reward for any information uh, that could lead to his arrest. They also say... His mother, who was actually attending this appointment with him and was not injured, is cooperating with them and giving them information. There's limited information that they can share with us from her, but they say that she is cooperating mm -hmm. with them and providing information. Sadly, they did update us to tell us that all of the victims in this particular shooting were all women, uh, four of them fighting for their lives now at a local hospital, one of them deceased. 
uh, but they say that they feel like they have a lot of information to work with. And the reason mm -hmm. they are putting out the identity and asking people to focus on that picture uh, is because they, they are desperate to find this person. They believe he's armed. They believe he's mm -hmm. dangerous. And they're telling people, don't confront him. Uh, call us should you see him. Uh, but certainly today, being here, being on this street, seeing this response was absolutely surreal. This was midtown Atlanta and possibly mm -hmm. the busiest time of the day, a, a busy area with businesses and and uh, you know condos, and it was absolutely locked down at a standstill with helicopters in the sky and, mm -hmm. and police doing a grid search uh, to try and find this individual. So now I think becomes the question, how far did he get and is he still in that vehicle that he carjacked? And they, they say that they actually, sorry, have recovered that vehicle, but there could be another vehicle uh, that they're soon going to release information about. Katie, why did they feel so good lifting the lockdown if they didn't know, if they don't really even have a general idea where the suspect is? I think that video, Chuck, confirmed the fact that he left this area. I mm -hmm. think they needed to be thorough and make sure that they did a, and they said they did, they did a room by room search of that medical facility to make sure there was no chance he was still in the area. But they are confident that he is no longer here and that he mm -hmm. actually was the one responsible for that carjacking. And right. keep in mind, the area where they say he did this carjacking is one block off of 85. So the highway is gotcha. literally just right. uh, to my right. So I mean, he had a pretty easy escape route if, if he did, in fact, take that car. And do we know much more about him and his background? Is he a veteran? There's been some talk of that. Is there mental health issues with him that we know about? None. None of that has been confirmed by police. We have certainly heard all of that today mm -hmm. as well. And we've heard that the appointment that he was seeking at this facility was for a mental health purpose. But none of that has been confirmed yet by police. So okay. uh, still in the early stages. Katie Beck on the scene for us. Katie, thank you. Let me bring in Jim Kavanaugh. Jim, you know, I'm curious, the more media attention something like get, this gets, um, when is the point it's helpful to law enforcement and when is the point that it gets in the way? Well, I think right now it's helpful because we have a, a murderer loose in a greater metropolitan city. And you want to make the uh, the situation of everybody there and the police versus the killer. Mm -hmm. And so you want to leverage everybody's eyes and ears and everybody's fear and angst, which helps keep you safe, because fear is not always a bad thing, and to call in. In other words, the more people in the greater metropolitan Atlanta area that are paying attention to this story on the media and social media, the better chance of catching the guy before he kills again. So right now, I think it's a good thing. And Atlanta PD, Atlanta yeah. PD needs to leverage it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you say it right now is a good thing. When does it become a problem? Well, if it becomes, you know, uh, given too much uh, infamy to the, to the person, mm -hmm. if he's after infamy, then, you know, keep harping on his name and everything after he's caught or after he's killed. I think... Uh, as long as it's being used to capture him, his identity, then, uh, you know, once he's caught or captured, you know, let's not ever hear his name again one time, and then he can be, uh, you know, put in the dustbin of history. But uh, until then, I think it's critical that his identity is out there so he can be stopped because someone else's life is in the balance for sure. This guy, he carjacked once, Chuck. I, I'd say the chances are pretty good. He's probably carjacked again already. Right. Um, you know, if that's his successful. ticket. The gun is right. his ticket. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Let, I'm curious. When I talk to law enforcement officials, almost unanimously, they believe there are too, much, too many guns on the street. Yet the law enforcement community is never the face of this conversation about uh, regulating guns. Because, look, we have plenty of mentally challenged people in this country. Um, we have them around the world. We know, you know, I, I, the only way to prevent mentally ill people from getting firearms is to figure out a way to regulate the sale of firearms. Um, mm -hmm. Where's the law enforcement leadership on this? Well, you know, a lot of times they do speak up. The International Association of Chiefs of Police, of which I'm a lifetime member, speaks mm -hmm. up about it often. And, you know, organizations, when new legislation comes to bear, sheriff's associations, police associations, they'll stand up against, like, these open carry laws and say right. that's going to make things dangerous. But what happens here, uh, you know, people say, oh, we need to march in the streets, we need to march for our lives, we need to do all these things. It's all down to the vote. It's all down to when you go in the when you go in the voting booth, are you voting for the person 
who's going to do the things to make your community safer, or are you voting for the person that's not? That's basically it. And guess what? America at large is not voting right. for the person. Because we, the, the, the congressmen and the senators up there who won't even give us reasonable, reasonable gun legislation, not unreasonable gun legislation, not taking everybody's gun away or anything like that, right. but some reasonable things... They only respond to being reelected. They, you're not wrong, Jim. You know that's it. That's it's, that's all it is. And and so if you go in the booth and you say I don't want my kids to be subject to this or me in the work, then they got to pull the lever for the person who won't do that. No, let, it, you're, Jim. It is what I keep pointing out. Until somebody loses <laughs> an election for having uh, a position that isn't uh, in favor of many gun laws, uh, until that happens, I think we're going to. We have to figure out how to live in the society that we're, uh, that we're accepting. Anyway, Jim Cavanaugh. And, and, and the yeah. laws can reduce the shootings. Good laws can reduce the shootings, not totally eliminate it. Uh, ab absolutely. Jim Cavanaugh, always good to get your expertise on here. Jim, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, Thanks, circumstances, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, we're going to continue to follow this breaking news. We'll bring you any updates as we get them. And speaking of updates, we do want to update you on another manhunt that was underway for another mass shooting suspect just 24 hours ago. This one was in Texas. But late last night, police announced that they did capture the man who uh, had been evading them for days after allegedly shooting five people, including a child, over the weekend in Cleveland, Texas. This is footage of what appears to be the moments around his arrest. Authorities say a call to an FBI tip line helped track him down. This is a sense of media throwing it out there does give people... Uh, the information they need. He was arrested in the town of Cut and Shoot, Texas, after being found in a private home, hiding in a closet under a pile of laundry. He is now in jail and is expected to be charged with five counts of murder. Coming up, broken border, broken politics. The latest efforts by the Biden administration to address an expected migrant surge as DHS Secretary Mayorkas prepares a trip to the southern border. And the politics of immigration remain completely stuck here in Washington. And U.S. officials try to get to the bottom of these new claims by Russia that says President Putin was targeted by an attempted Ukrainian drone strike, which Ukraine denies. We're live in Kharkiv with the latest. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Let's turn now to the upcoming deadline that could lead to both short-term peril and long-term political pain for the Biden White House if Congress remains at a stalemate. No, I'm not talking about the... Potential June 1st debt limit cliff, I'm talking about the border, and Title 42's May 12th expiration date that has the Biden administration making more unilateral moves on the border. The Pentagon announced yesterday that 1,500 active duty troops are on their way to the border to reinforce the military personnel already there. The White House also announced late yesterday a new agreement with Mexico, allowing border officials to turn more migrants who are not from Mexico back across the border made in Mexico, if you remember that policy during the Trump era. And we learned this afternoon that Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas will be heading to the border tomorrow. These moves, all of them, are just the latest in a barrage of measures the White House has thrown at the escalating border problem in just the past few months. In January, the Biden administration expanded Title 42 expulsions to include other migrants from more Latin American countries. The following month, the administration unveiled new restrictions on asylum seekers in an effort to deter unauthorized crossings. Last month came the news of new processing centers in Guatemala and Colombia to help deter migrants from making the journey north, file for asylum in the country first. And as we already just mentioned, in the last 24 hours came the announcement of troops to the border and that agreement with Mexico to help essentially create the remain in Mexico policy, put it back into service, allows U.S. to turn back more migrants quickly must be noted that none of these measures has the weight of a comprehensive fix that could only come through Congress. Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas essentially told me Sunday the White House is trying to navigate a system that is already broken. Take a listen. The president on day one delivered a solution. He delivered immigration reform legislation that we had hoped Congress would act on swiftly. They haven't. Within the constraints of a broken immigration system, we are doing so much. The fundamental point mm -hmm. is we have more than two million cases in an immigration backlog that has been building year yeah. over year over year. What a powerful example of a completely broken immigration system. We have got to fix it. We need legislative reform. 
Folks, the looming Title 42 deadline and the expected surge of migrants uh, it will cause caps 10 years of gridlock and increasing bitterness on the issue of comprehensive immigration reform. The closest we came to comprehensive reform was back in early 2013 when the so-called Gang of Eight uh, group of senators reached a deal to overhaul the system, increase security, provide a pathway to citizenship for hundreds of thousands of undocumented immigrants already in the country. And we're going to build a fence, too, by the way. It passed with a supermajority in the Senate, only to die in the House, uh, under then-Speaker John Boehner. Since then, the road to compromise has only gotten rockier, as both parties have actually moved further apart on this issue, with Democrats increasingly hesitant to embrace the issue of border security in exchange for anything, and Republicans increasingly resistant to a pathway to citizenship for anybody, regardless of how much border security Democrats agree to. Some top Republicans have floated military incursions into Mexico in the name of national security, while others called Biden's sending the troops to the border, quote, political theater. Meanwhile, the Senate's top Democrat in foreign relations, Chairman Bob Menendez, really unloaded on the president's plan uh, to send troops to the border. He called it unacceptable, arguing it, quote, caters to the Republican Party's xenophobic attacks on our asylum system. Folks, this is the curse of our polarized political climate. The border is an issue that fires up partisan actors. So for a lot of politicians, the problem is better politics than a solution and actually trying to be for compromise is a political loser and only invites uh, snarky attacks from the left or the right, depending on your political persuasion. Gabe Gutierrez is live for us in El Paso. They've declared a state of emergency ahead of the end of Title 42. So, Gabe, look, the communities in Texas are preparing for this. Everybody knows what's about to happen. Um, the resources are they are trying to build them up. But it doesn't seem like anybody in these communities thinks the federal government can handle this. Absolutely not, Chuck. And look, they have been asking for federal help, not just for the last few months, but really for years. You laid it out quite well in your introduction. This is something that has been frustrating both political parties, not just for years, but really for decades. You talked about immigration reforms back in 2013. I mean, think even further than that, the Bush administration, and I believe it was 2005, 2006, when immigration reform fell apart there. I want to show you where I am right now. This is a Catholic church here in El Paso. We were here several months ago, Chuck, when President Biden visited the border. I can tell you, the number of migrants that I am seeing right now dwarfs what we saw several months ago in December and into January. You remember that spike back then? Then the numbers went down when the uh, policies, um, you know, there was a shift in policy at the beginning of the year, and the numbers went down a little bit. Also, it was in the middle of winter, so the numbers went down just a bit. But they are picking back up. And as you mentioned, Chuck, so many communities here along the border are just now frustrated. Three communities, El Paso, Laredo, and Brownsville, have declared a state of emergency. And the number of migrants here extends all the way down the block, around the corner, in several city blocks. There are hundreds, if not more than a 1,000 migrants sleeping here every night now. And local officials say they just don't know what to do. You mentioned that these 1,500 active duty troops um, that are being sent down here, they have drawn some bipartisan and criticism. You mentioned Senator Menendez today. I've spoken with some uh, some local migrant advocates who say that this is just it just sends the wrong message. That this is uh, that these troops down here makes it look like there's a war on migrants. Mm -hmm. On the other side, I spoke with you know some Republicans here who who argue that, look this is too little, too late. And again, you know you just turn around. Basically, 360 degree view. This is what some streets in El Paso, not all, but several city blocks here in downtown El Paso near the border look right now look like right now and again local officials here are just incredibly frustrated chuck gabe i see that there's uh porta potties behind you i mean this is stuff the city's put there to try to deal with this overflow situation correct <laughs> Yeah, there are volunteers here, and earlier today, we saw one of these trucks with uh, supplies coming here, and there was a scramble for food and water. I've spoken with several of these migrants. They've been here, you know, for days. One woman from Venezuela, and I will tell you, at least today, the ones that I've been speaking with, largely 
almost all of them have been from Venezuela. This one woman with a ten, her 10-year-old daughter, she's been here for 10 days. She was asking where she could find food and water. She's trying to get up to New York to meet up with family members there. And of course, we haven't even talked about the controversial policy of busing migrants to other parts of the country. Right. Governor Greg Abbott here in Texas is reviving that policy as well. So yes, local officials are trying to help these migrants in a humanitarian capacity. Again, as you said, these active duty troops now coming to the border to help Customs and Border Protection officials with logistical support right. in order to get a handle on this. Chuck. And it's not yet May 12th. Gabe Gutierrez and El Paso Force. Gabe, thank you. Joining me now is Delaware Democratic Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester. She's a national campaign co-chair for President Biden's 2024 re-election campaign. Congresswoman, I appreciate you coming on and spending a few minutes with us. Thank you, Chuck. Thank uh, look, you so much. Um, I, I understand that the majorities for the Democrats were very narrow when President Biden introduced his bill on immigration. But it went nowhere. And not only did it not go anywhere, the Democratic leads, Pelosi and Schumer, chose not to focus on it, chose not to emphasize it. I understand why. Very hard politically. But I don't know if you can just blame the Republicans for this when Democrats who are in control really never tried. Do you accept that premise from me or not? Well, I, you know, first of all, I want to start off with the fact that this is a dire situation all around. Mm -hmm. I had an opportunity to go to the Northern Triangle and visit and talk to people and understand that for some, it is about economic opportunity. For some, it is about saving their lives or that of their children. And so I want to start off with that as the foundation of the conversation. I think the other piece to mention is that, you know, immigration reform has been and had been bipartisan. And, you know, there have been these efforts to do something because it is important that it be bipartisan and that it be comprehensive. Um, I had the opportunity as well just to talk to um, my Republican colleagues about it from uh, I co-chair and started a bipartisan Future of Work caucus. And so this affects not just the economy and the situation of those individuals and families that are coming here, but it also affects our economy as well. Mm -hmm. President Biden, as you know, you mentioned the troops. I think it should be really clear that his, the intention is to have troops be there in an administrative capacity, not law enforcement, but in an administrative capacity. But it points back to the point that we need comprehensive immigration reform. And unfortunately, what has just been presented by our Republican colleagues does not get us any closer mm -hmm. to a real bipartisan um, a a agreement to be able to make the impact that we want to make. Is, is it now time to throw away the word comprehensive? It's pretty clear in this political environment with the way, I mean, at the end of the day, look, it's impossible to, to come out and campaign for moderation. I mean, we see it now, right? I know, you know, you get pounded as an elected official mm -hmm. if you call for a compromise, right? Your base of your party, left or right, comes at you. Um, and I feel like that gets in the way of, of essentially everybody holding hands and jumping off this immigration cliff together. So, Chuck, I, I don't think we need to get, a, get away from the word comprehensive, but I do think that we need to um, take the wins. Your last story was about gun violence. Mm -hmm. And the fact that after 30 years, we were able to come together in a bipartisan way and pass legislation really does have an impact on people. Did we go as far as we want to yet? No. Mm -hmm. um, but it made a difference. And I think that, you know, President Biden, I, all the years I've known him, it's been over 30 something mm -hmm. years. Um, that's always the way that he operated was let's try to find that common ground for the American people. That's why we were able to pass the bipartisan infrastructure law mm -hmm. after I don't even know how many decades. It's, right. it, you know, we've talked about that. And I think that there is a way forward. Is it to demonize groups? No. Is it to isolate folks? No. But is it to say, like, what creates a safer mm -hmm. environment for us? Yeah. What for, for those coming? What creates opportunity for those coming? Right. Th those things we need to do, and we need to do them together. On the issue of asylum specifically, 
I, you know, in the past, economic uh, pain has not been something that we've granted asylum to. It's usually political uh, issues or, or fear of safety. Where, where are you on this? Should economic opportunity be something we give asylum to? Well, I mean, the, the reality is right now, and I come from uh, my former job, I was Secretary of Labor in Delaware, and I was head of state personnel, mm -hmm. and I was also CEO of the Urban League, and so jobs are, like, really important to me. Just unveiled a jobs agenda. For us, we as a country have serious, serious needs for our workforce. Everyone from engineers, I just left a manufacturing plant, from engineers and folks that can work in manufacturing to farm workers. And so it is in our interest to also provide economic opportunity for others as well. Because it, 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 it is a win-win. No, I look, our, in, our inflation situation is something that that is arguably more to do with our, our immigration problem than it actually it does with interest rates. But that's a, that's a debate that I've been like yelling in a, in, a, uh, in a wind tunnel about. But let me pivot here to the debt ceiling. Yeah. Um, is the president, why shouldn't we call the president's meeting with Kevin McCarthy the start of a negotiation? Well, first of all, I want people to remember that the president had Kevin McCarthy in his office and talked to him before uh, the speaker passed his piece of legislation. The president wanted a real serious conversation. What was presented to us in the House was, to me, not a very serious bill. Um, there's a lot of different pieces that went into it to make, uh, to have mm -hmm. the members that on the Republican side pass it. Um, but it really, we know it wouldn't pass in the Senate. And, you know, and the president is now going to have this meeting on May 9th. And I think it's important for people to know he takes this seriously. Mm -hmm. We take this seriously. We know this is like not pie in the sky. Like this is people's mm -hmm. pensions and Social right. Security. And they, you know, some of the proposals that were in this mm -hmm. bill that uh, the Republicans passed had cuts to things like Meals on Wheels. Those are not serious conversation starters. And it's my understanding, you know, first of all, I've been in Congress, so I saw us mm -hmm. pass clean debt ceiling bills under President Trump three times. Right. President Trump himself even said, you don't negotiate right. on this. So hopefully the speaker will take President Trump's advice if I, he doesn't I take any I understand that, but do you accept, look, the voters put Republicans in charge of the House. So they have a say here. That's and the Senate can't get narrowly, a bill passed. Very right. narrowly. I hear you. A Senate bill can't yeah. pass the House. I take it that the House bill can't pass the Senate. So at the end of the day, there's going to have to be some negotiating here, correct? And, and back to the original point that I made... President Biden stands ready to work with folks because he's done it before. But we got to be serious about it. And I think most of us know that the stakes are that high, that this this May 9th meeting is going to be important, yeah. but also that, you know, the Senate, both Republicans and Democrats, come to the table as well. It's not, not just the Speaker of the House. Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester from the state of Delaware, also a Biden campaign co-chair. Thank you for coming on, sharing your perspective with us. Thank it was you. helpful. Appreciate it. Coming Thanks up, U.S. officials are trying to validate or invalidate Russia's uh, startling claim that Ukraine suddenly uh, tried to carry out a drone assassination attack on President Putin at the Kremlin. What it means for the war from the war zone next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The war in Ukraine arguably entered a new chapter today with the Kremlin this morning accusing Ukraine of trying to carry out a terrorist attack in what they claimed was a potential assassination attempt on President Putin at the Kremlin. Moscow made the allegation without providing any evidence other than this interesting video. And Ukraine has said they had nothing to do with this incident, calling it a, quote, trick from our opponents. President Zelensky also addressed the allegations in a press conference earlier today. We don't attack Putin or Moscow. Uh, we fight on, on our territory. We are defending our villages and cities. U.S. officials tell NBC News that they are looking into the alleged drone attack and its validity. Secretary of State Antony Blinken cautioned about taking any claims coming from the Kremlin at face value. I would take anything coming out of the Kremlin with a very large shake of salt. So... Let's see. Uh, we'll see what, uh, what, what the facts are. 
Um, and it's, it's really hard to comment or speculate uh, on this without really, uh, really knowing what the facts are. Well, and that video, uh, shall we say, looks a little too convenient. Joining me now is Ellison Barber in Ukraine, and I also have retired Lieutenant General Steph Twitty, a former deputy commander of U.S. European operations and an NBC News military analyst. Um, anyway, let me start, though, with what's going on on the ground in Ukraine. I know you are in a bunker right now. It's after curfew. Um, what attempts are U.S. intelligence officials making to try to at least back up Ukrainian denials? You know, this whole series of events has been fascinating to watch play out today because you mentioned that video. NBC News has not independently verified this video that has come out of Russia, but it first appeared on social media platforms. Russia has not offered any other evidence to support the claims that they are making. In Ukraine right now, uh, there is a warning from the U.S. Embassy tonight, warning of the uh, heightened ongoing threat of missile attacks, given the rhetoric of the last few hours and the missile strikes we've seen uh, in the last week, particularly on the capital of Kiev. Uh, but yet yeah, this video, Moscow is claiming that these drones appeared over the Kremlin overnight and that they disabled them. They say not just that Ukraine was trying to carry out some sort of covert strike in Russia's territory, but specifically they are claiming that they were trying to assassinate Russian President Vladimir Putin. Ukrainian officials from President Zelensky to defense officials have been quick to say that is not true. They say they had nothing to do with this, that they did not know anything about this. They say these were not their drones and that this type of attack would not benefit them in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. It's very rare for Ukraine to carry out any sort of strikes in Russian occupied territory, be that Crimea or physically in Russia. There was one instance back in December when there was a strike that was carried out on Ingalls Air Base and right. that was some 300 miles past the Russian border. But if you remember when that happened, you had senior officials in Ukraine uh, on background confirming to a number of news outlets that they were involved in that. Then you had the senior aide to President Zelensky essentially winking and nodding and mm -hmm. making a public statement saying basically that they were behind it, saying what goes up must comes down. That's right. not what's happened here. Uh, this is a situation where you very quickly had Ukrainian officials saying we didn't have anything to do with this. On top of it, they're arguing that this wouldn't benefit them on the battlefield. And right. President Zelensky is saying, hey, look, we do not have weapons to spare to carry something right. out like this. What Ukrainian officials say they think is happening here is that Russia is trying to set them up. You have the top aide to Zelensky saying that he believes Russia is trying to plan some sort of terrorist attack another aide saying that they think Russia is trying to plant this sort of false flag, if you will, to maybe set up some sort of strike that they're going to carry out on Ukraine as retaliation as we get closer to Victory Day, which is May 9th. It's an incredibly important holiday in Russia. Yeah. Uh, it commemorates the defeat of Nazi Germany, and they have these massive military parades on the, Red on the Red Square in Moscow. So from Ukraine's perspective, they are quickly saying, we didn't do this, this won't benefit us, right. and they are accusing Russia of essentially trying to set them up here, Chuck. Well, it has the whiff of that, and we know how important false flags are to Putin operations at times. Elson Barber uh, on the ground for us in Ukraine. Uh, again, after curfew, you are in a bunker uh, because you have to be. Uh, please stay safe. Thanks very much. Let me bring in General Twitty here, and let's pick up on this conversation. Um, you heard Ellison there, General, the importance perhaps of May 9th as a potential um, showcase day for, for Putin um, and them looking for some sort of excuse. What's your best estimate of what the excuse is that they're looking? They, they need a reason to do this. What do you think they want to do? Yeah, I see a couple of things here. First, if you take a look at the video that you just showed, Yes, it shows an explosion, but it didn't show a very large explosion. If Ukraine wanted to assassinate uh, President Putin, they would need a very large payload targeted at a particular window or door or opening, mm -hmm. and they would need something like a Hellfire fire missile. You know, going back, looking at the way the U.S. operates, they always put on their Reaper some type of Hellfire if they're going after a specific target or, or a specific person. You don't see that here. What I think is happening here, as you know, Chuck, Russia is out of options. They have lost in Kiev. They've lost in Kyrgyzstan. They're losing in Bakhmut. Uh, 
and they just don't have any options right now. And so one of the things that they may be doing is trying to expand larger and perhaps even go after Zelensky uh, himself. And so they have not attacked the, the headquarters per se that Zelensky resides in. So mm -hmm. they may want to expand the war to go after that. The second option is they may be trying to throw the Ukrainians off this counterattack. As you know, the Ukrainians have been sounding a, a counterattack for quite some time. We know that the Russians stepped up attacks uh, over the, the last week or so. And this could be a higher ratcheting up mm -hmm. the tax in order to throw the Ukrainians off. You know, President Zelensky was actually out of the country today. He was in Finland. He's been been doing that more lately. Um, would you be advising him to do that or not? Absolutely. As you know, this war is going on a year and a half now, and he must continue to garner support not only from NATO, uh, which Finland is a part of now, but all the other countries that have provided aid and support to Ukraine. I think uh, we must watch to ensure that uh, these countries, they don't get war weary on him. And I think that's his intent, is to go around the countries mm -hmm. to continue to seek the support, because I think he knows that this war is going to go on for quite some time, yeah. and he's going to need the support and equipment from these countries. General, last question. Why do we know so much about this counteroffensive? Why has there been so... There, there's a part of this that thinks, as a military planner yourself, are you at all concerned about how public all of these plans and knowledge... Obviously, some specifics aren't out there, but my word, we seem to know a lot about what could be coming next. That generally doesn't sound like usually good military strategy. You're spot on. The element of surprise is key whenever you're going to conduct a large scale offensive op uh, uh, offensive operation. And so, yes, I am concerned about uh, whether we're going to lose the element of surprise here. But what I will tell you, in my sense, is the reason why we're continuing to talk about this and this hadn't happened yet. Number one, the conditions are not set yet, uh, probably for Ukraine to conduct offensive. The weather, as you know, has been raining there. It's mm -hmm. mud, mud on the ground there, number one. Number two is he's still trying to get ammunition uh, in to be able to continue and sustain an, an offense. And number three, the equipment that uh, the West has pledged, not all of it's, it is on the ground yet. And so he's probably holding him back to start this offensive. Right. But I am concerned that we are telegraphing it a little bit too much. All right, Lieutenant General Steph Twitty, uh, it's great to get your expertise on here. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. After the Thanks, break, sir. the Fed raised interest rates again. Is that the last time for a while? You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. After more than a year of trying to tame high inflation, the Federal Reserve appears poised to finally pause its aggressive streak of interest rate hikes. Today, the Fed announced another rate hike of a quarter percentage point, the 10th consecutive increase since the start of last year. But the news from today's announcement may have been more about the central bank's future decisions as much as it was today's. Chairman Jerome Powell indicated that the central bank may now hit the pause button on any additional rate hikes. The markets were down slightly today after the news, closing down less than 1% on the day, but it was pretty much a trickle of a response. Steve Leisman, the CNBC senior economics reporter, has been uh, knee deep in the Fed story today, joins me now. So, Steve, um, tell me, is the Fed now divided on this, or, or are they starting to get unanimous that their rate hikes uh, are in the past? Well, the, the decision today was unanimous to raise a quarter and also put some language in there that suggested that maybe they'll push the pause button. I like the way you led into it because it's not a definite pause. It's a bit like, um, I don't know if you have, maybe you remember a VCR, you'd hit yeah. the pause button, but you're kind of other fingers hovering over the fast forward buttons or the play button. So mm -hmm. uh, they're still concerned about inflation, Chuck, and so they're not ready to sort of put away the rate hiking tools mm -hmm. they have. Uh, they're still going to watch the inflation numbers and see how much this troubles we've had in the banking system end up helping them with lower inflation. I have to tell you, I, I saw a stat today that was sort of startling to me that the market might be up year over year despite all these interest rates hikes. What does that say about the perception of the resiliency of this economy? 
Well, you know, they've been predicting a recession for quite a while now, uh, basically beginning when the Fed started to hike. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, our Fed survey, which we do every time the Fed meets, uh, a couple months ago had the recession beginning in June. Well, this time around, they pushed it ahead to September. Um, and so the, the economy has remained more resilient than we thought. The uh, unemployment rate has remained three and a half percent near 50 year lows. And so um, betting against this economy and underestimating the economy has not been a good bet. And corporate earnings season. I mean, I think a lot of people, is this all due to the sort of pre-recessionary layoff frenzy that we saw at the beginning of this calendar year? Well, companies have figured out a way to make money uh, uh, in both uh, low inflation and high inflation environment here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chuck, it, it's, it's, I think it's a testament to the resiliency of companies, the, um, the, the, the way that these companies have the ability to adapt as things go along. But also, they benefited a bit from high inflation, and, and some people think they're part of that high inflation problem where they have raised uh, th their prices right. more than their costs have gone up. They sort of have passed it. They've passed the inflation along to us. They haven't eaten any of this yet, have they, Steve? Well, of course, some of them have, and some of them have not have not prospered mm -hmm. in this environment. But many have done better than uh, you would have thought. I thought it would have been a, a tougher time for companies and corporate earnings, but it hasn't been uh, overall. Yeah. And you're right that the stock market's picked up on that, and they see uh, uh, decent earnings ahead. Those earnings uh, estimates have come down, but you're right. The stock market's re remained resilient in part because the economy's remained resilient. Now it looks like everybody is sort of prepared for a storm, and maybe the storm doesn't come. Anyway. I, I, I yeah. think that's right. Yeah. All right. Steve Leisman on the beat for us for the Fed and CNBC. Great to see you. Sure. Up next, campaign kickoff. Democratic congressman and former NFL linebacker Colin Allred throws his hat in the ring for Texas Senate as Democrats try to pick off a Senate seat against Republican Senator Ted Cruz. You're watching Meet the Press now. If President Reagan were around today, he might well be exiled by a modern Republican Party that in many ways seems dead set, dead set, on abandoning that special responsibility never to default. The only solution is presidential leadership. President Biden has been sleepwalking toward this crisis. Mr. President, it's time to wake up. Welcome back. That was today's dose of posturing on the debt limit from the top lawmakers in the Senate as the clock continues to kick down to June 1st. Lack of action comes as our White House unit reports that Democrats are fearing some political blowback for President Biden if the nation ends up defaulting. I'm joined now by today's panel, NBC News Washington correspondent, Yumi Sindor, former Democratic congressman from Michigan, Andy Levin, and Stephen Hayes, the editor and CEO of The Dispatch and an NBC News political analyst. Uh, Yumi, look, the fact is Democrats should be fearful of this because we have evidence of what happened in 2011. Um, everybody got bad poll numbers. Nobody is in a good... The, President Obama's lowest approval rating in that calendar year was in the month of the debt ceiling standoff. And congressional Republicans' uh, approval rating, I think, was one of the lowest at that time. There is not a win here for anybody. That's right. And when you talk to White House officials, when I talk to White House officials, they're very much in the, of the stance that their messaging is going to be that it's all the Republicans' fault, mm -hmm. that they lifted the death ceiling number of times under former President Trump, and that they'll be able to make that case to the American people. Republicans, of course, you hear M Mitch McConnell saying what they're going to say, which is this is all the president's um, fault. When I think of people, regular voters who aren't seeped mm -hmm. in what the machinations of the debt ceiling are, they're going to look at Washington and say, this place is not working for me again. Right. And you're going to see people who are looking at their 401k saying, well, by the way, Democrats, you're the ones in charge. You're the ones in the in the Oval Office. So why can't you figure this out? I think that this is definitely something where you're going to see everyday Americans who, are, who really look right. at this and say, here's another time where Washington is just not working it. A Andy Levin, I think this is the challenge for your party. I think you can, those that are well informed, you can make the argument, hey, they're posturing. But the, the folks that aren't paying that kind of attention, hey, you're in charge here. Yeah, we know. That's why we put you in there. You're supposed to figure this out, dude, right? Like, that's the challenge. Yeah, so, I mean, I do have to say as an aside, boy, it would be great for Mitch McConnell to be a leader and a statesperson ever, certainly at this moment, uh, and take some responsibility. But the thing is, we have to be very clear that we are ready to negotiate about the budget. Republicans won the House, barely. Let's negotiate about the next budget. The, the debt ceiling is not about future spending. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in it that's about f re reducing the debt or the deficit at all. It's just about paying the bills you already incurred. Mm -hmm. And it is shameful 
to posture about that or to, to put Americans in danger about losing our full faith and credit, about having the effect it would have on Social Security, I, I on pensions on and that. everything. But at the end of the day, President Biden is going to get left holding the bag if he, if he doesn't get this done. I, I think he's going to get it done. I mean, mm -hmm. I think he's going to get it done. But I don't think uh, negotiating, uh, if you set a precedent mm -hmm. that you're going to negotiate over this the, this debt ceiling, which yeah. virtually no other country even has. It's this right. artificial construct. It makes no sense. Uh, and it's it's harmful to the whole economy and to the whole, really, to our democracy. So, so 2011 was a mistake. Yeah, I yeah. think so. I do. Steve, what can the Republicans everybody's gain out of this politically? I mean, everybody's hypocritical on debt ceilings. Democrats have been hypocrites on this. Republicans are being hypocrites on this. And the fact of the matter is, at some point, there are going to be negotiations about spending. I'm sympathetic to the argument that Republicans are holding the country hostage, even if I think the president shouldn't be as absolutist as he's been saying, we will not negotiate mm -hmm. on this. I'm troubled by the, the kinds of rhetoric coming, getting from the White House, where the president, I think, is misleading. He just put out a tweet yesterday where he said, look, either we're going to have 22 percent cut to, to mm -hmm. discretionary spending, including veterans, or there's going to be a default, and this is the Republicans' choice. It's not the Republicans' choice. There's going to be a discussion about that. He's invited them to the White House. The more he backs himself into that corner, mm -hmm. the less likely I think we are to see any kind of a good outcome. What, what, does a, what does a compromise look like? I mean, I don't think the discharge position is it. That seems to be the break glass, and I get that one. What does a compromise look like? Is it a commission? Is it buying three months? I've noticed more Democratic lawmakers are open to a short-term extension. The feeling that I'm getting in talking to sources is that the, that a, a compromise looks like probably maybe more time and also parallel discussions. Because mm -hmm. uh, the White House has said, we're happy to talk about the budget. We just don't want it to be attached to the debt ceiling. So I imagine if there is a resolution, and I say a big if because I don't yeah. know that there is a resolution yeah. coming, um, that that's what it's going to look like. But you have a White House and President Biden who don't want to look weak on this, who right. want to make sure that they're sticking to their guns. And when they're talking to reporters and they're talking to debt Republicans, they're not moving on it. And you you want them trying the, hey, we're in the, I always say, you know, the debt ceiling has a news cycle. We're in the, hey, what about the 14th Amendment idea part of the news cycle? Or let's mint the coin. The mint the coin. I mean, yeah. Yeah. None of all of these have to be tested in court. Is it worth going down that road, do you think, or not? I think it's fine to explore all those options. But the, the real situation here is that the Republicans who barely hold the House and, and the Speaker who, you know, what did, how many votes did it take, 15 or something, for right. him to be the Speaker... They have passed something that is so absurdly out of step uh, with the overall country, mm -hmm. and it's never going to go anywhere in the Senate or with the administration. It's not a basis for any compromise. And so uh, we really have to get, you know, deal with the debt ceiling and then negotiate about the budget. McCarthy's so. in a weird box here. Right? He He's got to get something for this. Steve. Yeah, I mean, he created his own box to a certain extent, yeah. but Republicans are remarkably united right on now this. I, mean, yeah. I, I agree on, on a substantive critique of, of what they passed. Yeah. I agree. It's not that workable. And more important, from my perspective, it doesn't change the, the long-term trajectory of our debt. Yeah, for that's for right. the probably bad politics, but it yeah. doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't take seriously yeah. proposals for entitlement reform, which is what we need if we're going to actually change the trajectory of our debt. He's put himself in a position, but as long as Republicans are united, as long as Kevin McCarthy is getting rhetorical backing from people like Don Bacon in, in the House and Senate leaders, Republicans are going to be in a position to say to the, the White House, you've got to talk to us about this. But as a Republican, you just said entitlement reforms, which is the thing that yeah. they do not want to no, talk right. about. Yes, they do not. Yeah, no, uh, and it, it, even... Uh, all the presidential candidates at this point. Hey, I want to play a little bit from Colin Allred. He's a member of Congress from Texas who's decided to challenge Ted Cruz, his announcement video. Uh, let me play a little excerpt from it. I remember hearing the glass breaking and the shouts coming closer. I texted my wife, whatever happens, I love you. Then I took off my jacket and got ready to take on anyone who came through that door. And Ted Cruz, he cheered on the mob. We will not go quietly into the night. Then hid in a supply closet when they stormed the Capitol. But that's Ted for you. All hat, no cattle. We deserve a senator whose team is Texas. But Ted Cruz only cares about himself. You know that. Steve, I think they found somebody, the Democrats did, that is not uh, Beto O'Rourke. And I say this, Beto O'Rourke was yes. very much a partisan Democrat. For and sure. he came across as a national Progressive, Democrat. Progressive, sure. That's right. Colin Allred, I heard in an interview, he's talking about, he goes, you know, when something goes wrong in Texas, you know Cornyn's there. 
but you don't know Cruz is there. And I thought, that's an interesting decision. Go after that independent Republican voter. Well, and I think if you look at the way that he rolled out this video, Ted Cruz is vulnerable on that charge that Ted mm -hmm. Cruz is for Ted Cruz. He does a lot of media. He's on I Fox felt like News he was aiming this thing to, to your type of politics, to the right of center, like, hey, are you a patriot first? He seemed to be aiming for that. Yeah, period. I mean, I think he exaggerated what Ted Cruz was saying mm -hmm. uh, about January 6th. I mean, Ted Cruz, remember, initially called it a violent violent terrorist attack. And then, apolo and went to and then apologized Carlson to Tucker Carlson. Yeah, yeah. But he initially said that, yeah. even if he was responsible for some of the, the rhetoric beforehand. Will there be a Senate candidate that raises more money than Colin Allred against Ted Cruz, right? It, Ted Cruz is the, is the fundraiser here for the Dems, right? Yeah, I mean, don't bet against Colin Allred. If you look at his upbringing, uh, his tough upbringing, he's, he, if you look at his f football career, law school, terrific lawyer, and I served with him in Congress, he really is uh, a, a bipartisan guy who is, I think, really attractive to Texans across the board. You mean you get a sense the party's really going to take Texas seriously or not? It's a good question. I, I think after Georgia, they mm -hmm. probably will at least have some hopes have in Texas. Try. And right. they have to try because their map is so bad. Yes, and also exactly. when I looked at that video, I got a little bit of echoes of Joe Biden's yeah. um, election because of January 6th. Where Democrats have decided we can lean in on this and get some people to really be angry about this. Look, it's Texas. Keep an eye on Allred. I think this is going to be, I think he's going to be a nationally known figure in about a year. Uh, you guys are terrific. Thank you. Thank you all for being with us. I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Garrett Haig, who's in for my friend Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.